Good morning, everybody. You're very welcome to our press conference today on the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland. I'm joined in the press room today by Vice President Maros Shevchevich, who will react to the announcement by the UK government. Good morning. On uh, Monday, the UK government uh, tabled uh, legislation confirming its intention to unilaterally break international law. More precisely, to break an agreement that protects peace and stability in Northern Ireland, an agreement that we reached together only two years ago. Let there be no doubt. There is no legal nor political justification whatsoever for unilaterally changing an international agreement. Opening the door to unilaterally changing an international agreement is a breach of international law as well. So let's call it a spade a spade. This is illegal. The UK bill is extremely damaging to mutual trust and respect between the EU and the UK. It has created deep uncertainty and casts a shadow over our overall cooperation all at the time when respect for international agreements has never been more important. That is why the Commission has today decided to take legal action against the United Kingdom for not complying with significant parts of the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland. We have been withholding this legal action over the last year because we wanted to create a constructive atmosphere to find solutions. The UK government's decision has left us with no choice but to act. First, we are proceeding a step further with the infringement process we launched in March 2021 regarding, for instance, the movement of agri-food. If the UK does not reply within two months, we may take them to the Court of Justice. Second, we are launching two new infringements against the UK. One for failing to carry out the necessary controls at the border control posts in Northern Ireland by ensuring adequate staffing and infrastructure. And one for failing to provide the EU with essential trade statistics data to enable the EU to protect its single market. Ladies and gentlemen, the protocol was the solution agreed with the UK government to protect the Good Friday Belfast Agreement in all its uh, dimensions, avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland, and protect the integrity of the EU's single market. We know that there are some practical difficulties in implementing it. We have said so openly. That is why my team and I had been engaging extensively with all stakeholders uh, on the ground, resulting in a set of solutions put forward in October, showing genuine and unprecedented flexibility. For example, our proposals would reduce sanitary and phytosanitary checks and controls by, by more than 80%. They would cut customs paperwork in half, create an express lane for goods moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, simplify certification, a single three-page document for whole lorry full of different goods. And they would uh, allow even the movement of certain goods that would otherwise be restricted, such as chilled meat, like sausages. This is a solid offer, making a tangible difference on the ground. Today, we have uh, fleshed out uh, these proposals, proving they can work and they can work fast. We have even published the draft certificates that businesses would need uh, to fill out, showing just how simple and easy they are to fill in. And I would like to show it to you. These are the three pages which need to be filled per lorry or one once per month. Not 300, not 33. This is how simple it is. And this is what we can do if we work well together. Because our proposals are all about simplification and therefore in stark contrast with, for instance, a dual regulatory regime proposed by the UK. A dual set of rules, EU and UK, would lead to a mountain of paperwork and bureaucracy 
enough to bury a small business in Northern Ireland that wants to profit from access to both the UK's internal and the EU's single market at once. So once again, permanent solutions and simple operations of the protocol proposed by the EU versus constant uncertainty with UK ministers having an open hand to change the rules on a whim. We want Northern Ireland to embrace the all benefits of this unique uh, position because our commitment to the people of Northern Ireland is unshakable. Despite today's legal action, our door remains open to dialogue. We want to discuss these solutions with the UK government. Given that the UK hasn't sat down at the table with us since uh, uh, February, I think it's a high time to show some political will to find joint solutions. The UK has stated that uh, for us to talk, the EU must be willing to change the protocol. On the contrary, we have always said that our package of proposals has never been a take it or leave it offer. It can evolve, but it is not an unconditional offer. There must be safeguards included that protect the single market because the risks for our market are real, not theoretical. And the conditions which allow Northern Ireland to access the EU single market for goods are not for the UK to change. It's simply legally and politically inconceivable that the UK government decides unilaterally what kind of goods can enter our single market. This is not the path for the two partners standing shoulder to shoulder when facing global challenge, uh, challenges uh, and uh, that uh, this uh, should be uh, forged like that. I'm convinced that with political will, we can find solutions for people and businesses in Northern Ireland. But this must be done jointly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice President. We'll now take a few questions. Just to let you know, first of all, we have published press material online, as well as the two position papers which the Vice President referred to, including the document that he showed. So you'll find all of that online. Uh, Adam, please, first. Uh, Adam Parsons from Sky News. Uh, Mr. Sefcovic, uh, there are lots of people here in Brussels who think that the European Commission is being played by the British government for its own domestic concerns. Do you have trust in the good faith of Boris Johnson and Liz Truss? And if not, were you tempted to go harder and further with the legal proceedings that you've taken against the British government, or do you still have those options up your sleeve? Thank you very much for that question. Of course, uh, I think our today's action, the fact that we have to start uh, legal proceedings and legal action against uh, our ally, against uh, our, our, our partner uh, in these uh, very difficult times where we face uh, together the global challenges is, is, is pretty telling what the level of, of, of the trust uh, uh, we have. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are fully aware of the current circumstances um, in the world, in Europe and in Northern Ireland, and therefore for us, uh, the peace on the island and uh, our commitment to the people of Northern Ireland uh, uh, have, uh, I would say, overriding uh, principle in uh, how we approach these negotiations. Therefore, we decided uh, that our response should be measured, should be proportionate, and uh, we are offering not only legal action here today, but we've been fleshing out what concretely we could do. I was just showing, showing you three pages of the, of the certificate, three pages. And uh, I can also tell you that uh, what we are fleshing out in our today's proposals exactly responds uh, to the queries, to the questions, to the propositions I heard when I personally visited uh, Northern Ireland. And what I heard since then, because I, I'm in regular contact with the business community, with civic society and uh, with the political leaders, uh, uh, in um, uh, Northern Ireland. What they, what they want us uh, to focus on is uh, east-west trade, uh, reduce administrative burden, make uh, the operation of the protocol as, as smooth as possible, and this is exactly what we, are, what we are doing. 
And uh, what we are offering is joint solution, which would offer stability, which would offer legal certainty, which would offer legal clarity. And uh, when you are talking to the, to the business operators and uh, potential investors, what you hear from them, you know, for us it's very important to know if we are going to invest, are we going to produce for 5 million, 50 million, or 500 million? And that has, I would say, very important uh, implications. We offered and promised to the people of Northern Ireland to have the best of the both worlds. And this is what we want to offer them. What we are now getting in uh, form of this draft bill would be the mountain, uh, monstrous mountain of paperwork, which uh, uh, the business operators in the Northern, uh, Northern Ireland uh, will, have, will have to fill up. I mean, go and ask, uh, I don't know, the milk producers in, in, in Northern Ireland how he, how he or she can produce the milk, one sort for the EU, another one for the UK, or any kind of manufacturer who wants to benefit from the access uh, to both uh, markets of the UK and the EU. Should he have two different production lines? So, so therefore, what I'm, what I'm saying here is let's focus on practicalities. Let's focus on how to make uh, the operation of the protocol smooth, and uh, this is what, what we are going to do. Therefore, our uh, response today uh, is, is measured. Uh, therefore, it's proportionate, and uh, that's, the, that's the reason why we also are fleshing out that what we are putting on the table, it's really oven ready. If we have a positive reaction from the UK side, political will and engagement, this can be done in no time. As we did it with the medicines, we demonstrated that we can sort out a very difficult issue within a very short period of time. And what we are offering here are ready-made recipes, how we can solve the problems of SPS checks, problems of uh, customs procedures. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, we've always been ready to discuss other issues as well. But there was radio silence from the UK side since February. Jess. Thanks. Uh, Jessica Parker from BBC News. Um, just to ask you, if this stalemate continues and the UK persists with its legislative plans, how far are you willing to go? Would you hit the UK with tariffs, even suspend the whole trade agreement? And also, you say you won't renegotiate the text of the treaty, but if that could open some further doors to compromise, why won't you do that? I think I will start with the, uh, with the second part uh, of, of your questions. I, I'm sure that you've been uh, following the, the, the Brexit negotiations in, a, in a great detail, and you know that it took us uh, uh, more than four, four years to find that delicate uh, compromise uh, where, first and foremost, uh, uh, we took the interests of the Northern Ireland people um, uh, into uh, most appropriate account, because for us, what was the, of paramount importance was uh, to protect the peace and stability in the, in the Northern Ireland, to avoid the hard border uh, on the island and uh, protect uh, the, the single market. And we've been pondering over these issues for years. This was the best solution which we found together. I have to say that uh, concrete uh, uh, Northern Ireland unique uh, uh, solution we've been developing at the express wish of the UK government. Uh, we, after laborious negotiations, where we've been really going uh, through the very demanding uh, text uh, line by line, we agreed upon that, we signed it, it was ratified, and uh, now we cannot, we cannot imagine that uh, we can come up with something better which would correspond to these three priorities. Peace, no hard border, protection of the uh, EU single market, on top of it, uh, giving uh, the Northern uh, Ireland uh, people and operators this unique opportunity to, to have access to 500 million potential customers, which is the only place in the world which has it. And um, therefore, we are uh, ready to uh, show that uh, the agreements we negotiated, the protocol we agreed upon, offers us enough uh, uh, legal and political space to make sure that uh, uh, the operations could be smooth, that the checks could be inobtrusive if we finally get the proper access to the, uh, to the IT and to the, to the, to the data. Uh, we are talking indeed about very, very limited uh, uh, checks with a three-page certificate with, uh, uh, I would say, a few 
a uh, few, few trucks being checked uh, if they would go uh, through this green lane based upon the uh, risk assessment uh, by both uh, UK and uh, EU authorities, and everything can world work perfectly well. And therefore, we are ready to invest additional efforts, additional imagination into this discussion, but we are not going to reopen the whole discussion, renegotiate uh, the, the protocol withdrawal agreement, uh, which uh, uh, was uh, approved and ratified uh, just uh, uh, two years ago. Thank you. Bruno. Uh, Bruno Waterfield, uh, Times of London. Um, you, you said just, just now at the beginning, you said, let's call a spade a spade. This is illegal. Um, and you were talking about the, the Northern um, Ireland Bill. Yet the infringements you're talking about today have got nothing to do um, with that bill at all. They've got nothing to do with something that is illegal, something that you say is a breach of international law, something that's very, very serious. In fact, the infringements you're opening uh, today are, about, are to do with the implementation um, of the protocol, nothing to do with the Northern Ireland Bill uh, at all, and their um, infringements that um, you could have um, either taken forward uh, or introduced um, at an early stage. So why is it that while you call a spade a spade, something that's illegal, you're not actually prepared to do anything about it at the moment? I think we are, I think, uh, we are, I think we are pretty clear, clear in uh, our reaction um, uh, to the bill. I think I'm making it even clearer uh, this morning when I, when I say that uh, the bill, uh, as it was drafted and tabled, it's illegal, period. And uh, I think that uh, I should also add one additional argument that there is no doubt uh, that uh, uh, there is no legal justification whatsoever for unilaterally changing an international agreement. And uh, I'm, I'm sure the UK government knew perfectly well what uh, they signed up to when they agreed uh, to the protocol, although I have to admit they didn't do a very good job uh, uh, explaining it to the public. And most importantly, it's simply legally inconceivable that the UK government decides uh, what kinds of uh, uh, goods can enter the EU uh, single market. And I have to tell you that yesterday I, I had uh, the extensive session with uh, the uh, members of the European Parliament. We had an uh, uh, extensive session with, uh, with the member states. And it's, it's quite clear uh, that the uh, position of the EU on this one is, is absolutely uh, united and that the protection of uh, uh, our single market is a key interest uh, for the whole EU and the member states, and we just simply cannot accept that the UK would simply unilaterally change an agreement in, in this respect. So coming back uh, uh, to the first part of your questions, we are just uh, um, arguing uh, with our infringements of, of today uh, that the, the key uh, parameters of uh, the arrangement, which we've been working so hard to achieve, uh, uh, within the protocol, be it SPS checks, be it uh, customs uh, uh, procedures, be it uh, the sharing of the information, so we can safely say to uh, our uh, member states the single market is protected, simply are completely disregarded. And I, I have to say, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry to state it, that uh, uh, since the March of the last year, I haven't seen any constructive idea how to smooth the operation uh, in, in a joint uh, uh, partnership way coming uh, from the UK. There have been only new and new demands uh, coming from the UK government uh, uh, very often, and not even one mention, once mentioned in the discussions I had with the Northern Ireland uh, partners. So what I want to say is that by today's actions from one side, we're showing that we will be quite resolute in uh, uh, defending European single market, but from other side, they're still open for the negotiations because we believe that uh, the joint uh, solutions will bring needed legal certainty, clarity, stability uh, to, uh, to the island of Ireland. And this would be the best message uh, for peace. It would be the best message uh, for the people in Northern Ireland and uh, the business operators there that actually they are the only place in the world which have uh, the, this unique access uh, 
uh, to both uh, UK and uh, EU single market. And, and I know how interesting, interesting this proposition is for investors who are just waiting and hesitating. Should we come in? Should we wait? Uh, what would be, what would be, what would be the, the future? What would be the, the legal framework within which uh, we would operate? Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer Rankin, The Guardian. Um, concerning the, uh, the infringement procedures, the, the UK has made it clear it will go ahead with this bill that doesn't recognise the role of the European Court of Justice. So what does the Commission do if at the end of the infringement procedure process the UK simply doesn't recognise the verdict of the court or any fines that might have to be paid? And to follow up on a question, I, I didn't hear you answer my colleague's question about how far is the Commission willing to go? Will the Commission... Is the Commission prepared to impose tariffs on British goods? Is the Commission prepared to suspend the entire TCA? Thank you. I think that the role of European Court of uh, Justice in uh, uh, ruling uh, on the matters uh, uh, of the European law is very clear. It's clearly reflected in the withdrawal agreement. It's clear, clearly reflected uh, in, in the protocol and not respecting, uh, not respecting the European Court of Justice uh, uh, rulings would be just piling one breach of the international law up, upon another. Does the UK want to go in, in, in that direction when the rule of law is something what we are discussing at uh, every international fora these days? It's, it's, it's the way forward. Is it, is it uh, compatible with the proud British traditions of upholding and respecting the, the rule of law? and international law in that regard. So that's, I would say, the, 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 the political question I'm, 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 uh, uh, I'm throwing up. And, um, of course, how other potential partners uh, uh, would look uh, at, that, at the UK when they will be negotiating the agreements with them. Will that be changed in one year, in two years? Will they, will they stick? Will they will be respected? I think these are, of course, the questions for the UK government uh, to respond. But I think that for us, the best way would be let's come back on the safe grounds of respecting our treaties, respecting uh, international, international law, and respecting uh, the, the agreements and commitments we made uh, to, the, to the people in Northern Ireland that we will sort out this problem, that we will, we will uh, focus on uh, unintended consequences of the protocol, that we would make uh, the, the protocol uh, operations as smooth as possible and we would create uh, these additional opportunities for the Northern Ireland businesses because I think this is uh, clearly very important and you know looking at the economic performance of the last year I, I think that Northern Ireland did quite well and of course I do not want to go into the deep uh, analytics of that but I'm sure that uh, the, the access to the single market was, was part uh, of that good uh, performance and coming back to uh, to your question and the question of your colleague on the, on the, on the TCA. We are now bringing uh, the, the argument also into the, uh, into the debate, which I'm sure will be in uh, House of Commons, House of Lords, that uh, there is a better way uh, to solve uh, these issues than uh, having this legal dispute with the EU, than uh, acting unilaterally, and that uh, alternative, which I'm sure would be welcomed uh, by the people in Northern Ireland and uh, by the international community, is uh, work on the joint solution, smoothing the operation of the, of the protocol and working on this together. And despite of uh, all this and our experience of the past 18 months, we are ready to do that. Our doors are open. We are ready to engage on how to make sure that the operation of the protocol are as smooth as possible. We have recipes. We know how to do it. We demonstrated it with the medicines issue. I just show you how the certificate uh, could look like, how it would be smooth for the Salisbury uh, trucks uh, supplying the, the operators in uh, uh, Northern Ireland. You've been informed how uh, what we suggested in the concrete terms. Uh, concerning the uh, trusted trader scheme. So there is a lot of opportunities uh, what we could do and how we could uh, tackle this issue. So we expect that also the debate uh, in the British Parliament, be it in the House of Commons and House of Lords, uh, will take some time. Of course, uh, if uh, this draft bill uh, will become the law, then, of course, I cannot exclude anything. 
but we are not there yet, and we want to solve this issue um, as the two partners should, through negotiations, looking for the common ground and delivering for the people in Northern Ireland. Okay, I'll take one final question. Joe. Thank you. Uh, Joe Barnes from the Daily Telegraph. Um, so one of London's main complaints with the current protocol is that while it's an operation the DUP will not enter Stormont, and that's why they're saying it doesn't respect the Good Friday Agreement. Um, so do you think the UK government is being disingenuous with that, or will you be willing to potentially move further by putting stuff, uh, extra stuff into law, maybe adding, changing the EU's customs laws to accommodate more changes on Northern Ireland, or do something to placate the DUP? Or do you have another plan for kind of convincing the DUP to come into Stormont to kind of please the British government? Thank you. Of course, forming the, the, uh, the, uh, the Assembly and the Executive, uh, it's uh, for the people of Northern Ireland to decide. It's uh, for the uh, UK uh, government uh, uh, to work on with the political parties. Uh, in Northern Ireland, we have no intention to interfere in this process. We've been very clear from the beginning, and uh, I think the protocol, it's absolutely explicit on that, uh, that uh, we respect, uh, first and foremost, Good Friday Belfast Agreement in all its dimension, and we respect also uh, constitutional and territorial arrangements of the UK. So I, we cannot be clear on, on that fact. And uh, as you know, I, I have uh, the, the regular meetings with the political leaders in uh, Northern Ireland, and I was very explicit, and I will, I will repeat it uh, uh, here as well. We do not seek a political victory here. We do not seek a political victory. What we want is to find workable, long-term solution based uh, on the law, giving the legal certainty to the operators uh, in uh, uh, Northern Ireland uh, on how uh, the, the protocol would be implemented. As you know, the European Union is a, is a peace project, and, and we've been supportive of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement from its outset, be it politically, be it economically, be it financially, be it by different projects which I had the privilege to visit when I was in, in, uh, in Northern Ireland, Flurry Bridge, Schenkel Road uh, Centre in, in Belfast, and, and it made a lasting impression on me how important this is and how we should remain committed uh, to build up on what was, uh, what was already done over the uh, uh, last uh, uh, two decades, how important it is uh, for the people in, in Northern Ireland. And that's our contribution. I'm just uh, saying very openly, we want to work with all parties, we want to find the solutions, but what we need is a political will uh, from London to engage with us, to work on smoothing operations uh, and implementation of the protocol and to do it in a way uh, that it would bring the lasting benefits for the people of Northern Ireland. Thank you very much, Vice President. This now concludes our press conference. Thank you very much uh, to colleagues and to, to the interpreters uh, for, uh, for working on this press conference. Uh, stay tuned for the press conference by the President at 12 o'clock all the way from Egypt. Thank you very much.